As I'm sure almost everyone else has, I'd heard of the backrooms before, but never in my wildest imagination did I believe they were real or that there could be so many variations of them. That was until I found myself in what I can only describe as the yarn maze. It started on a rainy evening when I decided to explore an old, seemingly abandoned craft store at the edge of town. The sign was faded, the windows dusty, but something about its quaint forgotten charm drew me in. Inside, the air was thick with a musty smell of old fabric and mothballs. I wandered through aisles of forgotten sewing machines, buttons scattered like lost treasure, and then I found it. There was a door at the back, covered in a tapestry of woven yarn, intricate and oddly out of place. Curiosity got the better of me. I pushed the door, expecting resistance, but it swung open effortlessly, revealing not that storage room I anticipated, but a corridor that stretched endlessly. I couldn't help but notice that the walls were covered entirely in multicolored yarn. The pattern seemed to shift in the dim light, creating an illusion of movement, of life. I stepped in, thinking it a quirky installation or perhaps an artist's secret project. The door clicked shut behind me, a soft, almost inaudible sound, but in that place, it echoed like a vault ceiling shut. The air was different here. It was as if the yarn absorbed sound, creating a silence so deep it was almost loud. I walked forward, my footsteps muffled by the yarn underfoot, which felt unnervingly like walking on a sponge. As I ventured deeper, the corridor began to twist and turn, branching off into countless others. Each turn I took, the patterns became more complex, more sentient. Faces seemed to form in the knit, eyes that followed me, mouths that whispered inaudibly. The temperature dropped, and a chill ran down my spine, not just from the cold, but from the realization that this place had an eerie consciousness. Then, I heard it, a soft, rhythmic clicking, like knitting needles at work. It grew louder as I approached a vast room where the ceiling disappeared into darkness above. In the center, an enormous figure sat, made entirely of yarn, its many arms weaving and unweaving the walls around it. It was creating the maze, altering it, trapping me within its endless loops. Panic began to set in. I tried to retrace my steps, but the paths had changed. The yarn under my feet seemed to cling, to slow me down, as if it was alive. It almost seemed like it was trying to integrate me into its tapestry. The creature, if it could be called that, didn't chase me, but its presence was everywhere, in every strand and stitch. I realized then that this wasn't just a space, it was a living entity, feeding off the lost and the curious. Hours, maybe days, passed. Time was yarn, stretching infinitely. I found others, or what was left of them, now part of the walls, their features eerily preserved in knit patterns and their eyes lifeless but seemingly aware. In my desperation, I started to unravel the yarn from the walls, hoping to disrupt the creature's creation or perhaps find a way out through destruction. The yarn fought back, tightening around my fingers, but I persisted. I pulled and tore until I found a thread that felt different, less alive. Following this thread, with the creature's clicking growing frantic, I finally saw the faint outline of the door. With a burst of adrenaline, I yanked the thread, causing a section of the wall to unravel rapidly, creating a hole just as the yarn creature loomed over me, its form unraveling into chaos. I leapt through the opening, back into the dusty store, slamming the door behind me. The store was silent, the rain had stopped, and the first light of dawn was creeping through the shadows. I never spoke of what happened, fearing disbelief or, worse, curiosity that might lead others there. But sometimes, late at night, I hear a soft clicking, and I wonder if the yarn maze is still out there, weaving its endless hungry corridors, waiting for the next curious soul to step inside. Let me start by saying that I thought this was an innocent bedtime story made up by my grandma, perhaps similar to a lot of other such stories. She'd always tell me how you had to be careful while knitting, lest it lead you into the yarn dimension. It was all fun and games, until the night I found myself tangled in that very tale. It began on a chilly autumn evening. I was organizing my late grandma's belongings, sorting through boxes of her old crafts. Among skeins of wool and unfinished scarves, I found a peculiar pattern book, its pages yellowed with age, titled Pathways Through the Threads. Intrigued, I decided to try one of the patterns, a complex design that seemed to twist in ways that defied logic. As my needles clicked and clacked, the room grew unusually quiet, the kind of silence that feels heavy and almost expectant. The yarn, a deep endless blue, flowed like water through my fingers. With each stitch, the pattern grew, but so did a strange sensation. 
The room seemed to stretch, the walls receding into shadows, replaced by an expanse of woven patterns as if the very air was knitting itself around me. Then it happened. With one final stitch, the world as I knew it unraveled, and I was no longer in my grandmother's old sewing room, but standing in an endless expanse where everything was made of yarn. The ground beneath my feet was a soft woven texture, and the sky above a tapestry of interlocking threads, varying in shades from light to dark. At first it was truly mesmerizing, this liminal space where every direction looked like an art installation of fiber. But soon, the charm wore off. There were no sounds, no wind, just the occasional thrum of vibrating strings, as if the whole dimension was a giant silent harp. I walked, or rather, waded through this yarnscape, looking for a way out. That's when I noticed them, figures, or what I thought were figures, moving in the distance. They were woven too, but with a purpose in their stride, their forms shifting slightly with each step as if they were patterns trying to maintain a shape. The closer they got, the more I could see. They had faces, or approximations of faces, made from knots and loops. Their eyes were empty, hollow sockets of darker yarn, and when they opened what might have been mouths, there was no sound, just an unsettling void. Panic set in, and I remembered Grandma's warning, never finish the pattern if it feels alive, for you might not like where it leads. I had laughed it off as a child. Now it was anything but funny. I started to run. How does one escape from a world where every direction is more of the same? I tried to unravel my way back, pulling at threads, hoping to reverse the pattern I knitted. But the yarn beings were faster, their movements eerily synchronized. They surrounded me, their yarn limbs reaching out, not to harm, but to incorporate, to weave me into their endless fabric. In desperation, I recalled another piece of Grandma's advice, almost forgotten in my panic. If you're ever caught, sing the lullaby of the spindle, it might just set you free. With nothing to lose, I sang, my voice shaky, the old tune she used to hum while knitting. To my astonishment, the beings paused, the forms loosening slightly. As I continued, the yarn around me began to unravel, creating a pathway. I followed it, singing louder, more confidently, until the yarn world started to collapse into a single point, pulling me through a tunnel of intertwining colors back to my reality. I woke up in my chair, the knitting needles on the floor, the yarn a tangled mess. The pattern book was gone, as if it had never existed. But the experience left me with a chill, a cautionary tale about the magic hidden in the mundane, and a newfound respect for my grandma's stories. Now, whenever I see someone knitting, I can't help but wonder if they know the risks of what they weave, or if they, too, might one day find themselves lost in the yarn dimension. When I was in the fourth grade, I started to get interested in programming. It was a way to escape the mundanity of school life, to create worlds where I had control. Little did I know, this interest would lead me into a world far beyond my control, a world woven from the threads of nightmares. One evening, while browsing an obscure forum known for sharing experimental software, I stumbled upon a link titled yarnspace.exe. The description was cryptic, explore the endless fabric of reality, knit your own universe. Intrigued, and with a child's lack of caution, I downloaded it. The program was unlike any game or simulation I'd ever seen. When launched, it opened to a vast, seemingly infinite expanse made entirely of yarn. The textures were hyper-realistic too. Each strand of yarn had its own shadow, and its own slight imperfections. The ground, the sky, the occasional structures, all yarn, in various colors and weaves. At first it was truly fascinating. I could manipulate the environment, pulling at threads to reshape the landscape or create objects. But the more I played, the more the game began to feel off. The physics were too real for something made of yarn, and there was an eerie silence, only occasionally broken by the soft, unsettling sound of yarn rubbing against yarn. One day, after hours of exploring, I found a door, standing alone in a field of knitted grass. Doors in games usually lead somewhere, so I opened it. What I found wasn't another level or a secret room, but a space that felt like a glitch in reality itself. The yarn here was darker, the patterns chaotic, forming shapes that seemed to move when you didn't look directly at them. I heard whispers, or maybe it's just the wind through the yarn, but it sounded like voices speaking in a language that felt ancient and forgotten. The air grew cold, and the light dimmed as if the sun was being unraveled from this knitted sky. Then the figures appeared. They were humanoid, but made entirely of tangled, writhing yarn. Their movements were jerky, like marionettes with tangled strings. They started to approach me, or rather, my avatar. I tried to exit the game, but the controls wouldn't respond. 
Panicking, I yanked the power cord from my computer. The screen went black, but for a moment, I swear I saw the Arn figures reaching out, as if trying to pull themselves through the screen into my world. After that incident, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Nights were the worst. I'd hear the soft rustle of yarn, see shadows that looked like threads moving at the edge of my vision. My parents thought I was just having nightmares, but it all felt too real. Years passed, and I learned to live with the occasional feeling of unease, convincing myself it was just a child's overactive imagination triggered by a creepy game. However, when I went to college, I found an old USB drive in a box of my childhood things. On it was yarnspace.exe. Against my better judgment, curiosity got the better of me. I plugged it in, ran the program on an isolated machine, just to see. The familiar yarn landscape loaded, but this time there was something new. A small figure in the distance, made of yarn and standing still. As I maneuvered closer, my heart sank. It was shaped like a child, with a face eerily similar to mine from back when I first played the game. I noticed the figure held a sign, woven from black and red yarn. You left the door open. That night, I didn't just hear the rustle of yarn, I felt it, as if the threads were weaving themselves around my reality, pulling me back into that liminal space where the game ends. And the nightmare begins. I have this random childhood memory of taking a road trip to the Arch in St. Louis one summer. The journey was long, filled with the usual mix of excitement and boredom that only a child on a family trip can experience. Somewhere along a forgotten stretch of highway, my dad decided to take an unplanned detour, looking for a place to stretch our legs. We ended up at what looked like an old rest stop, but it was unlike any I had ever seen. Instead of the typical concrete and picnic tables, everything was covered in, or perhaps made of, yarn. Yes, yarn. The ground, the benches, even the small dilapidated building that might once have been a visitor center were all woven from countless strands of multicolored yarn. All the strands created a patchwork landscape that seemed to pulse with a life of its own. Curiosity got the better of me, and while my parents were busy looking at an old map, I wandered off towards the building. The yarn under my feet felt oddly alive, springy yet firm. As I approached the structure, the air grew thick, the kind of thickness you feel in dreams where moving feels like wading through water. I pushed open the door, which was surprisingly heavy, made from what looked like tightly knitted wool. Inside, the light was dim, filtering through yarn-woven windows in eerie, soft hues. The room was empty except for a single rocking chair in the center, also made of yarn, slowly rocking back and forth with no one in it. The creaking sound it made was the only noise, a rhythmic whisper that seemed to say something I couldn't quite catch. Then I noticed the walls. They weren't just covered in yarn, they were moving, as if breathing. Patterns formed and unformed, faces appeared, stretching out from the fabric, mouths open in silent screams or whispers, I couldn't tell. They looked like people, trapped or perhaps born from the yarn itself. A cold dread settled in my stomach. I wanted to run, but my feet felt entangled, not by yarn, but by fear. That's when I heard a soft voice, almost like the rustle of wool. Stay with us. Knit with us. The faces on the wall seemed to lean closer, their expressions pleading. I don't know how, but I found the strength to move, to tear my eyes away from the hypnotic patterns. I ran out, the door slamming shut behind me with a muffled thud. Outside the sunlight seemed almost too bright, and the air too thin. By this time my parents had started calling me, their voices normal, oblivious to the yarn world I'd just escaped. We left immediately, my parents chalking up my pale face in silence to car sickness, but as we drove away, I looked back. The rest stop was no longer made of yarn, but it was just an ordinary, abandoned place. Yet in the window, I saw a figure, waving slowly, made entirely of yarn. Its form was unraveling slightly with each wave, as if it was coming undone by the very act of saying goodbye. Years have passed, and I've never found that place again, nor have I heard of any similar phenomenon. But sometimes, in quiet moments, I feel a soft tug in my consciousness, like the gentle pull of yarn, reminding me of the world where the fabric of reality was something you could weave or be woven into. One time in 8th grade, my class went on a field trip to this old historic town center. The town was quaint, with cobblestone streets and buildings that seemed to lean into each other as if sharing secrets. But there was one place that stood out, or rather, didn't fit in at all. It was a small, unassuming shop at the end of a narrow alley, simply labeled The Yarn Weaver. Curiosity eventually got the better of us, and a few of us slipped away from the group to peek inside. 
The door creaked open, revealing a space that felt like it was caught between reality and a dream. The shop was filled with yarn, but not just any yarn. It was as if every color imaginable had been spun into existence here, creating walls, floors, and even furniture out of tightly woven threads. The air inside was thick, almost palpable, carrying with it a faint whisper of old stories and forgotten times. We ventured further in, our footsteps silent on the yarn-covered floor, which felt oddly solid yet gave slightly underfoot. The room seemed to stretch endlessly, corners bending into new spaces that hadn't been visible from the entrance. As we explored, the space began to shift. Corridors of yarn would appear where there had been none before, and doors made of woven threads would open into rooms that defied logic. One room was filled with nothing but chairs, each one a different era, all facing a blank wall as if waiting for a show that would never start. Another room had windows that looked out onto scenes that couldn't exist, vast oceans where there should have been land, or cities floating in the sky. The deeper we went, the more this space seemed to react to us. The yarn began to move, not just in the breeze we created by moving, but as if it had a life of its own. Threads would snake around our ankles, not tight enough to trap, but just enough to make us feel watched and guided. Then we heard it, a soft, rhythmic sound, like the heartbeat of the place itself. Following the sound, we found a loom, ancient and massive, weaving by itself in a room that felt like the heart of this liminal space. The room was creating more yarn, but not just any yarn. This was the very fabric of the space we were in, expanding, contracting, altering. Suddenly the loom stopped, and the room grew cold. The yarn around us tightened, and the whispers grew louder, more urgent. We realized then that we weren't just visitors, we were part of the weave now. The space wanted something from us, perhaps our stories and our essence, to keep weaving its endless tapestry. This is where panic set in. We tried to retrace our steps, but the paths had changed. The yarn was no longer just a material, it was a sentient force, guiding us, perhaps towards an exit, or perhaps deeper into its core. Just as despair began to set in, one of us remembered the old tales about yarn and fate, how cutting a thread could change destinies. With a desperate hope, we found scissors on a table that hadn't been there before. One by one, we cut strands of the yarn that seemed to bind us, each snip echoing like a bell in the silent space. The fabric of the room shuddered, and a path opened, leading back to the shop's entrance. We ran, not looking back, the whispers fading behind us. When we burst out into the alley, the shop was just as it had been, unremarkable, as if nothing had even happened. We never spoke of that day again, but sometimes when I'm alone, I feel a tug, like a thread pulling at my memory. It reminds me that somewhere, in a space between, a loom waits, weaving the stories of those who dare to wander too far into the liminal. For a while in elementary school, me and my friend Maddie were obsessed with knitting. We'd spend recesses and after-school hours weaving together colorful yarn, creating scarves, hats, and even little dolls. It was a simple joy, but one day, our hobby took a turn into the uncanny. One afternoon, after a particularly rainy day, we found ourselves in the old, musty storage room of the school, a place where lost projects and forgotten supplies went to gather dust. Tucked away in a corner, behind stacks of ancient textbooks, we stumbled upon an enormous ball of yarn. It wasn't like any we had seen before. It shimmered with an iridescent glow, changing colors subtly as if alive. Curiosity peaked, we decided to unravel it thinking it might be enough to make something grand, like a tapestry or a giant blanket for the school's play area. As we pulled at the yarn, it seemed endless, stretching out into a fine, almost invisible thread that led us deeper into the room. This is when we noticed the air was growing colder and the lights were dimming, even though it was still daytime outside. The yarn led us to a part of the storage room we had never noticed before, a narrow, doorless passage that seemed to have been woven from the very yarn we were holding. The walls, floor, and ceiling were all made of tightly packed strands of yarn, creating a soft yet eerie tunnel. The texture under our feet was unsettling, like walking on a carpet of whispers. Maddie and I exchanged a look, the kind that says, should we? But ultimately, the allure of the unknown was too strong. We ventured in, the yarn guiding us like a thread through the labyrinth of our childhood fears. The tunnel twisted and turned, the yarn changing colors more vividly now, glowing blues, haunting purples, and sickly greens. The air was thick with a musty smell of old wool, and a faint humming filled our ears, as if the yarn itself was singing a lullaby of dread. We walked for what felt like hours, though time seemed to stretch and warp in this liminal space. 
Shadows moved at the edges of our vision, shapes that looked like people but were made entirely of yarn, their eyes hollow, their movements jerky like marionettes controlled by an unseen hand. Then, the tunnel opened into a vast, cavernous space, a hall with walls that seemed to breathe, pulsating with the rhythm of a heartbeat. In the center, there was a loom, massive and ancient, with a figure sitting before it. The figure was woven from yarn, its face featureless except for eyes that glinted with a cold, knowing light. Welcome, knitters, it spoke, its voice a chorus of whispers. You've brought me more material. We realized then that the yarn we had been following was not just leading us, it was absorbing us, weaving us into the fabric of this place. Our hands, where we held the yarn, had started to fray, becoming threads themselves. In a panic, we tried to retrace our steps, but the tunnel behind us had sealed shut, the yarn now forming a solid wall. The figure at the loom began to weave faster, and with each pass of the shuttle, the room grew smaller, the walls closing in. We screamed, but our voices were muffled, absorbed by the yarn. Just as despair began to take hold, Maddie, ever the braver one, grabbed a pair of scissors from her knitting bag. With a swift, decisive cut, she severed the yarn we were still holding. The world snapped back. We were back in the storage room, the ball of yarn now just mundane, lifeless, at our feet. But we never spoke of that day again, and we never touched yarn after that. Sometimes, in the quiet, I swear I can still hear that humming, a reminder of the liminal space where yarn wove reality into nightmare. <laughs>